Right. Um, I'd like to talk to you guys today about Newton's laws of motion. Um, and we'll start off with Newton himself. Now, I don't know if you guys know much about Sir Isaac Newton. Um, he was a, a British physicist from a few hundred years ago. You're probably familiar with the story of uh, an apple falling on his head. I, I don't think it's actually a true story, but what Newton did do is he spent a lot of time uh, thinking about motion and thinking about forces. And he came up with lots of rules and laws, two of which we're going to talk about today. Okay? Uh, he also came up with uh, a theory of gravity and, and lots of ideas about light as well. So uh, today is going to be about uh, Newton's laws of motion. But before we do, I want to go back over one thing that you were supposed to be working on uh, earlier in the week, which is about resultant forces. Now, a resultant force or an unbalanced force basically means the overall force that's acting on an object. Because in lots of situations, it's not just one force pushing or pulling on something. There's more than one. So I've got four uh, examples here on, on the screen of multiple forces acting on an object. So the first one, this guy in an aeroplane, so there are 300 newtons pulling him down, but 200 newtons pushing him up. So if I wanted to know what the resultant force was in this situation, okay, uh, I would have to think about, one, the size of these forces, but also the direction. Now, because these two forces are acting in opposite directions, I have to subtract the smallest force from the biggest force. So if I want to know what the total resultant force acting on this object is, okay, I take 300 newtons, I minus 200 newtons, and that leaves me 100 newtons. So the resultant force is 100 newtons, but I also have to give a direction. And in this case, the direction is going to be downwards because the biggest force is downwards. So have a look at this next one. What's the resultant force going to be in this situation? So what's the overall force acting on the object? If I was to take these three forces away and replace it with just a single force, what force would do exactly the same job? Hopefully, you guys got five newtons to the left. So these two forces here, the 20 and the 25, are acting in the same direction. So those two we add together. Okay, that's the 20 plus the 25 here. Then we subtract those from the biggest force, which is the 50 in this direction. So it's 50 minus 45, which leaves 5 newtons. And the resultant force is always in the direction of the biggest force, which is 50 newtons here. Then we've got this thing that looks like a meatball in a Roman centurion helmet. Uh, we've got two forces acting to the right, so we add those together. 15 plus 20 gives 35. But we also have one force acting to the left we have to subtract. So we have 35 minus 25, which gives 10 newtons to the right. And then the final one, this monkey. Uh, he's got two forces acting upwards, so we add those two together. And we subtract the force up acting in the opposite direction. And this one gives zero newtons. And we say in this situation there is zero resultant force. Which brings us on to the, the next thing. You know, how are these objects going to move? You know, how is the first, second, third, and fourth object here going to move? And probably most of you are going to say straight away, well, the gorilla at the bottom isn't going to move at all because it's got zero resultant force. But that might not be true. And in order to, to answer the question of how are these objects going to move, we have to understand Newton's first law of motion. So today we're going to look at two of Newton's laws of motion. He has three of them, but we're going to leave the third one for another day. So Newton's first law of motion. Uh, if you look it up in a book or on the internet, it's going to say something like this. An object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and in the same direction until acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now, you might read that and think, well, I, I don't really understand what that means. So we're going to simplify this a little bit. Okay? Now, we're going to break it down into two parts. What happens if forces are balanced and what happens if forces are not balanced? Now, if you read up here, it says an object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So if the forces are balanced, it's going to remain at rest or remain stationary. Or the other possibility, if the forces are balanced, okay, is it stays in motion with the same speed. So the two possible things that can happen if forces are balanced are that the object will remain stationary or it will continue at a constant speed. So let's go back to that gorilla. And this gorilla had balanced forces, 14 newtons up, 14 newtons down. But we don't really know how it's going to move. We know that it will either remain stationary or 
it will continue at a constant speed. Now, to work out which, we need more information. You notice it says remain stationary or continue at a constant speed. Now, those remain and continue words are saying it's going to keep doing whatever it was doing before the forces became balanced. So if this gorilla was stationary before the forces became balanced, it's going to remain stationary. If it was moving before the forces became balanced, then it's just going to continue moving at a constant speed. Now, the other part of Newton's first law is what's going to happen if the forces are not balanced. But if, it's, if they're balanced, it will remain stationary or move at a constant speed. But if they're unbalanced, the speed will change. It will either accelerate and get faster or decelerate and get slower. Okay, so let's look at another situation here, like the man in the aeroplane. In this case, the forces are unbalanced. There's a bigger force downwards than up. Now, either that object will be accelerating in a downward direction, or that object will be decelerating in an upward direction. So it could actually be that that man in the aeroplane is moving upwards, okay, but getting slower because the downward force is bigger than the upward. Or it could be that he's actually getting faster in a downward direction. We need to know more information about the situation. We need to know was the guy in the plane moving upwards or moving downwards to begin with. So this is Newton's first law of motion. And the key thing to remember is this information here on the right hand side. OK, balance forces mean it will either stay still, stay stationary or go at a constant speed. We need to know what was happening before to be able to break it down to one answer. And if the forces are unbalanced, it's either going to get faster, accelerate or get slower, decelerate. So that's Newton's first law. Now, Newton's second law, again, uh, before we kind of go into this law, I just want to remind you, because Newton's second law involves acceleration. And acceleration, as we learned a few weeks ago, is the rate at which the velocity or the speed, for year eight purposes, we can think of velocity and speed as being the same. Acceleration is the rate at which speed and velocity changes. Okay, and we had a triangle for that that we used in the lesson, said that acceleration was change in velocity over time. Now, Newton's second law is all about acceleration. Okay. And one of the ways that we can state Newton's second law is that the acceleration of any object is directly proportional to the size of the resultant force, but inversely proportional to the mass. Now, again, some of you might look at that and say, well, what does that really mean? Well, the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the size of the force. The simplest way to put that is the bigger the force acting on an object. So I've got two balls here. This one's got a big force. That's a green arrow. This one's got a small force. The bigger the force, the more acceleration. It's fairly obvious, really. If you go and push something with a big force, it's going to change its speed more than if you push it with a, a smaller force. Okay. At the moment, though, I'm assuming that the mass is going to stay the same, whatever I do to the force. Now, the other part of this says the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. Now, that means if you have a small mass, you get a large acceleration. If you have a large mass, you get a small acceleration. So it's like the opposite. Okay, Here, if it was a big force, you got a big acceleration. If it was a small force, you got a small acceleration. But when it comes to mass, big mass means small acceleration. So if you go and try and push a big object, it's very difficult to change its velocity. But if you push a small object, it's easy. Now, mathematically, we can write Newton's second law like this, where the acceleration A is equal to the force. We've got to be careful here that this F is the resultant force, the overall unbalanced force acting on an object divided by M, the mass. Okay, whenever we use this equation, acceleration is measured in meters per second squared, remember. Force is measured in newtons and mass is in kilograms. So in a minute, you guys are gonna be solving some problems using this equation, okay? And those problems are gonna be attached on Google Classroom. Before you do, I want to do a couple of examples of how we can use this equation for second, Newton's second law of motion to solve some problems. So here's the first problem. I want you to calculate the acceleration of this block. So we've got a five kilogram block with two forces pulling on it. OK, so the first thing we're going to do in any situation where there's more than one force is calculate the resultant force. So they're both acting in the same direction. So the resultant force is four newtons plus six newtons is ten. Now we're going to work out the acceleration using the equation that I gave you on the last slide. So acceleration is force divided by mass 
the force is the resultant force, 10 newtons. We divide it by the mass in the picture, which is 5, and we get the acceleration of 10 meters per second squared. Okay, so remember this unit is one that people often forget for acceleration, meters per second squared. Remember, whenever you carry out a calculation, I always want to see that you've included the equation. That's got to have an equal sign in it, like over here. The work in, so 10 divided by 5, the answer, and then the unit. Let's do one more. So in this case, I don't want you to work out uh, the acceleration. Okay, they've already given me well, the deceleration in the question. I want you to work out the mass. So just like last time, I need to work out what the resultant force is. This time I've got three forces acting. I add the two that are going together, together, eight and four, and then I subtract the one that's going opposite, and I get a resultant force of three newtons. Now, on the sheet I've given you, I've put the equation into a triangle. Okay, so we've got force on the top, mass and acceleration on the bottom. I want to find mass, so I cover up M, and I'm left with F on top of A. So I get mass is force over acceleration. Remember that force is always the resultant force. Okay. I plug my numbers in, the resultant force is three, the acceleration given in the question was half, and I get six kilograms as the mass. So you guys are gonna do uh, some problem solving for me. Can you make sure that all your answers are put straight onto the document that I'm going to share with you? And when you've submitted them, I'll check them and see how you've got on. Okay, hope everyone's doing well. See you later.